Hello, good evening. My name is Elias Munsha, and I'm going to give you a few minutes to spread the word around. Today, we have a very interesting topic. Now, the core reason why we have to uh, present this topic is because today is, is um, the day um, African Freedom Day. I almost said International Day of Africa, but I realized that uh, that's not what it is. It's, um, it's Africa Freedom Day. And since it is Africa Freedom Day, I am going to give a lecture. I'm going to give a presentation regarding Africa. And so the theme this year has got to do with culture, culture for Africa and how that Africa can be united and everything else. However, today on TV Bakweto, I thought of coming to you in order for us to explore some thinking around the African continent, around African unity, and how we can reimagine the myth, the African myth. That is what we are going to be talking about today. In my lecture, I am going, once I finish my lecture, I am going to let you respond. And one of the ways through which you can respond is to uh, come online and respond to some of the thoughts that I'm going to present today. Now, I realize that in presenting some of these thoughts, they may appear to be a little bit different and a little bit insensitive. But in order for us to make an advancement as a people, as the African people, we need to begin thinking differently about so many things. And that's why I'm going to introduce you today to a concept that is known as post-Africanism. And the whole reason why we must present post-Africanism as an alternative outlook, as an alternative worldview regarding Africa, is because we must begin reinterrogating what it means to be an African. So far, the African Union is headquartered in Addis Ababa, Ethiopia. Its predecessor is known as the Organization of African Unity. One of the issues that we struggle with as a people, as Africans, is this crisis, not only a crisis of identity, but also a crisis of philosophy, a crisis of how we think about Africa. I must submit to you today that in order for us to make even very little advances in our self-concept as a people, we need to begin thinking differently. And so, and so in most cases, and I'm going to deal with some of these later as, I, as we advance through my talk today, we, we need to begin interrogating what does it mean to be an African and see how we progress from there, okay? And so my talk today is, 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 is entitled Reimagining the African Myth. Reimagining the African Myth. And the two that I am using to propose to you today in order for us to reimagine the African uh, uh, myth is what is known as post-Africanism. So how does post-Africanism then reimagine or help reimagine the African myth? The first point is that Africans must challenge this attitude of victimhood. Now, when we say victimhood, of course, a lot of things come into play. The first thing that you will notice in much of the philosophy, in much of the worldview that informs most of our people here in Africa, is this idea that somehow an African is a victim. Very rarely do we listen from Pan-Africanists without going away with this feeling that our people are victims. Either they are victims of circumstances, they are victims of slavery, or they are victims of somebody else who did something against them. In order for us to begin thinking differently, we must move beyond this idea that we are victims. It's very important. 
If we remain within the, uh, the, 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 the orbit of victimhood, we cannot make any advances. We cannot go uh, uh, forward. This constant idea that somehow everyone else is out to get Africa or a piece of it creates a psyche that always mobilizes to fight the perceived external forces and yet without spending enough time to try and develop the internal dynamics that are going to help Africa. And Africa cannot exist, cannot to continue to exist on adrenaline, meaning we are a people that are just out there looking out for survival all the time with adrenaline rushing through our bodies each time of our existence. We need to begin shifting the African continent from a continent of victimization to something else. And that is why, as a post-Africanist, we must propose new ways of self-conceptualization, new ways in which we look at ourselves, new ways in which we perceive who we are as a people. And most importantly, we must move away from the victimhood uh, mentality. The second idea, apart from just moving away from victimhood, is this rampant idea right here in Africa, right in Africa. And the, when I say a rampant idea, is, is, is this dream that most Africans have had, that in order for the continent to move forward, we require a united Africa. Now, this is going to sound a little bit more controversial and I expect it to be. The idea that the continent of Africa must subsist as a one united nation is actually a colonial dream. It is not born out of African realities. The continent of Africa was not one united um, a, a continent at any given time. It has never been. It was always a very uh, competitive place with different tribes, with different societies, with different nations subsisting. Some were powerful, some were less powerful. But this idea that for Africa to subsist, it must subsist as one united political entity is not a worldview that sustains, that is sustainable in order to help the African continent. The reason is, Instead of paying attention to several other uh, values that are important to develop Africa, we begin focusing on bringing together this vastly united piece of land, that this vastly um, um, diverse piece of land. And we think that unless we first of all unite it into one country, it cannot develop. We need to move away from that instead of making African unity as a prerequisite to African development, we need to shift our attention to something that is much more doable and much more achievable. In this case, what, what is this thing? First of all, it is in making African society as they, present, as they are presently to become sustainable in themselves. Afterwards, we can then move to regional integration. It is only after we have integrated regionally that we can dream of a one united Africa. Here is the contradiction that is inherent in being an African. One of the most shocking things is that the Southern African development um, uh, area, for example, just the mere lack of integration between Malawans and Zambians is shocking. The lack of integration between the people of Katanga and the people of Zambia is shocking. The barriers that we have created regionally is shocking. And so in order for us to make tangible movement, we need to first of all for a moment 
Stop focusing on this huge, grand, united dream. And instead, focus on the smaller pieces of regional integration. Once that is achieved, it will be very easy to make African nations much more competitive against each other, against the world, and against the global, the global economy. And so that is, that, is, that is the thing. This idea that we are then going to uh, leapfrog from regional integration straight into African integration is colonial. This is what Cecil Rhodes himself envisioned. Cecil Rhodes, as a colonialist, envisioned that Africa was going to be a united continent from Cape to Cairo. And this unity was going to be forced upon this land mass, and it was going to be one united country. That dream did not end with Cecil Rhodes. Several other pan-Africanist leaders succeeded Cecil Rhodes, and they started pushing for this kind of dream. That's why now a united Africa sounds like cliche. It sounds like a slogan that Africans throw around without deeply thinking about regional prejudices that keep Africans apart. And so in order for us to make a difference, we need to ask why, for example, should the Mukongo find it very difficult to move between Angola and, 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 and DRC Congo? Why should a Tonga have to have a pass to move to cross the Zambezi between um, uh, 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 southern Zambia and northern Zimbabwe? Why should we uh, 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 have difficulties taking or, or, or moving between, between two different countries, between the, the Luapulans in Zambia and the Luapulans in Congo? Those are very important questions that we must ask ourselves when we are dealing with African unity. African unity is not something that is going to be imposed out there in Addis Ababa. African unity begins with our own borders, the eight borders with regard to Zambia, the borders with regard to Nigeria, the borders with regard to Chad or Mali, the borders with regard to Congo or the borders with, with Namibia. That is one of the ways through which we are going to continue to subsist as a people. And so we must give up this grand dream and concentrate on smaller, smaller pieces. In fact, let me give you this challenge. The idea that for Africa to subsist, it must to show its power, it must be united into one political entity contradicts history. Throughout history, nations that dominated, in fact, were much more smaller countries beginning from Greece to Rome to England or France. These are small countries, and yet they dominated the world. In other words, your size as a country or your size as a people is not necessary to, um, uh, uh, to show how dominant you are or not. And so we as a people in Africa, we are trying to say that unless we are all together into one united political entity, we cannot make it. But that is not the case. Europe is perhaps one of the most fragmented and, and diverse piece of land, very small landmass with a lot of diversity. And yet it has managed to dominate the world for much of the centuries. What we need to begin shifting in Africa is this mentality that unless we unite, and by unite I mean unless we create one united republic of Africa, we cannot subsist as a people. I don't think that is necessary. However, we must begin taking smaller steps of regional integration and common sense um, uh, aspects of unity in order for us to grow. The other point that we must mention in reimagining the African myth is to reorient the Africans from this idea that community comes first to a more humane idea that the African person is important. The African individual is important. 
Because you cannot sacrifice the individual at the altar of community. In fact, it is a misunderstanding of Ubuntu itself if by Ubuntu we mean that the individual is not as important as the collective. Because how can you have the collective without having the individual? That is why individual liberties matter. They should matter in Africa. They should matter everywhere. Individual liberties, very important. There is no way we can accept this narrative that has developed that the individual is there, the African individual is there only to serve the objectives of the collective, be it the village or the state. That is not sufficient. It is not going to help our people develop. We must begin respecting individual liberties, individual human rights. They are important because the individual is important. Even when we go to the scriptures, God created. Before he even created people, he created a human being. One human being. Because a human being is important. And so... We cannot agree to the narrative that the African governments are there just to hold all these polities together and yet neglect the viability of individual liberties, individual freedoms. Every African is important. Every African should be respected. And Africans should be at the forefront of respecting other Africans. Not only respecting the village, not only respecting the community, not only respecting the political entity or the nation, but rather respecting individuals. It is out of this respect for individuals that we can have a health respect for our communities. And so there are so many despots, so many dictators across Africa and across the world who tell individuals to say that you are not as important. You must sacrifice your humanity at the altar of the community. That is not enough. The African individual is important. We cannot allow people being imprisoned without trial and say that they are doing it out of service for the, for the, for, for the whole. No, that particular one individual who spends an extra day in jail is important and must not necessarily be detained. That individual is important. The attitude that you have towards that individual determines the attitude that you are going to have towards the whole. Usually, those who advocate for a polity of communalism that disrespects individual liberties, they themselves become dictators. And they turn the entire community into a service station for their own interests. Our own history as Africans is replete with dictators who turned an entire country into a nested for their own selfish interests. They never respected the people. We can draw lots of lessons and lots of history from, 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 from Congo, from Central African Republic, and several other experimental dictators who never amounted into anything significant. We need to give up on this idea that is rampant, that the community must be saved first. It's much more important. The African individual is important. The individual African matters. The other thing that we must, we must um, uh, deal with in reimagining the African myth is, 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 is this idea that the, the, more, the more you talk, this, this idea that, that pointing and blaming others is synonymous with being a Pan-Africanist. Here is an example. There are several African leaders who get celebrated as great African leaders, not because they have enhanced the lives of Africans, but because they have insulted the people who hate Africa. In other words, when you insult the people who have insulted Africans, you are celebrated as an African hero, even if you have done very little to enhance the lives of the Africans. In other words, our heroes, are created out of those 
who we perceive to be fighting the people who hurt Africa. Even when our heroes are doing nothing to actually work on actual integration. Without mentioning names, there is a hero right now of most Africans in East Africa. Unfortunately, uh, this hero passed away. However, when you look at the record in terms of regional integration, you're going to see that this gentleman was anti-regional integration. And yet he is greatly celebrated by Africans, by most people, to have been a great Pan-Africanist. So why is there this tension then? Why is there this misunderstanding of heroism in the Pan-Africanist uh, uh, movement? How is it that nationalism is usually misunderstood to be Pan-Africanism within, um, uh, within our continent? So nationalist leaders, self-based nationalists, I mean selfish leaders who are in looking, inward looking, looking only to advance their own country. How are they celebrated to be Pan-Africanist when they in fact go to great lengths to undermine regional integration? We need to interrogate what it means to be an African hero. We need to begin rethinking what it means to be an African. The other thing regarding heroes is most of us have an issue with history. Now, this is in two ways. First of all, there is an issue with a history that is, that is Eurocentric. I agree that is a problem, but there is also another issue with history in the sense that we Africans are celebrating African leaders who are not well celebrated in the countries where they come from. In other words, they oppressed those populations and yet to other Africans, they are great and they are greatly celebrated. The question is, how are we going to apportion heroism? Where are we going to learn lessons about being an African hero? Is it in how much somebody speaks out against those people who hurt us? Or it's in how much a person actually invests in the African people, in common sense solutions that help our people? Those are some of the thoughts that comprise post-Africanism, a new way to think about what it means to be an African, a new way to reimagine what it means uh, to be an African and a new way of thinking about, about what it means to be, to, be, to be an African. There was a speech a few years ago that was made about, about, about uh, foreign aid and foreign investment and everything else. And there is this idea that somehow Africans must rail against foreign aid because foreign aid does not help and everything else. And yet Africa does not have a problem with foreign aid. Africa has a problem with abuse of everything, beginning from aid to production to everything else. However, those people who rail against foreign aid appear to be heroes, appear to be heroic today. Some of the most advanced nations receive aid from their fellow advanced nations. Today, the largest recipient of foreign aid in the world is Israel. And yet never are you going to hear Israel railing against the so-called funders or aid givers to Israel. They never do that. They take that aid and they use it for their people. They are accountable to their people. They hold elections and are accountable to their own people. That is perhaps one of the models that we need to adopt in Africa. The model of accountability and the model that says that no matter what we have, whether we have wealth through production or wealth through aid or whatever it is, we are going to put it all together so that it works for the advancement of our people. These are preliminary thoughts on post-Africanism and the reason why we are 
advancing and advocating for a different way to think about the African myth is because it is important for us to begin thinking afresh about Africa. So far, the Pan-Africanist dream has been in existence for a century, if not two centuries. And yet it has not helped to spur a fresh imagination of what it means to be an African, to make an African much more competitive. It hasn't done that. And for us to make advances for the African, we need to begin thinking differently about it. The last point that we need to look at in reimagining the African myth is with regard to education and science, science, technology, and education. So far, somehow, in, in some cases, there is this misunderstanding that to be African means to be non-scientific, right? And sometimes even foreign universities, non-African universities, they try to, to emphasize this idea that somehow to be African means to be non-scientific. We need to push back against such a narrative you can still be, Africa can still be scientific. If anything, we need to be scientific. We need to advance in terms of technology in order for us to be competitive. And where are we going to get this technology? We are going to get it as one world community because science is science. This idea that we must then develop our own science in Africa in order for us to advance quite truly it will make us feel quite proud and quite happy and, and, and feel good about it. But what we as Africans need to do is to begin collaborating in terms of science and technology with the rest of the world. Why should we have a new um, uh, formula for semen if another formula already exists? So we need to integrate all that knowledge. We need to integrate all these uh, uh, new technologies, adopt them so that the African continent continues to be, to be competitive. This concludes my lecture on reimagining the African myth, post-Africanism today on international, on, on African Freedom Day. I don't know why I'm referring to it as International Day of the African. No, but it's Africa Freedom Day. Thank you very much for joining me. I'm now going to open the, the lines so that we can have an interactive session to interrogate ourselves into how we are going to be thinking about, about, about Africa. Um, uh, Brian Impande, how are you doing? I'm great, I'm great, Uncle Musha. how are you? <clears throat> I'm very well. Today we are dealing with the, the Africa Freedom Day and so it's not a very sexy topic because when you bring politics, everybody has an opinion on politics, but the harder work of thinking about Africa um, mm -hmm. is, is not a very sexy topic, so to speak. Yeah, yeah. Um, so I've given a few thoughts here. What is your reaction? Yeah, uh, <clears throat> I would like to agree with you to, to a larger extent. Uh, you see, just like you've said, in, as Africans, uh, one thing that we've realized is that we love politics, which is not a bad thing, because it means that we want to be part of, uh, you know, the, the, the governing system and whatever is happening in our government. We want to be part of it, we want to have a say. But there's a sense in which we need to start realizing that as Africans, we are one people. And as such, uh, the, the dream, you know, for Pan-Africanism, uh, you know, others might say, has, has still not died. The, 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 the dream that our forefathers, the Kwame Nkrumahs of this world, the, the Kaundas had to making sure that, you know, all African countries are free and we do the things our own way, is still not dead. Although right now what we have is that our thinking is always not that of an African, but we are what we want to align ourselves too much, you know, to, to the Western culture. Now, I like the point that you've <clears throat> mentioned where you say uh, 
when we think of Africa, we, we, we want to align it or to differentiate it to say there's no science in it. And, you know, one person once said to say, <clears throat> as Africans, we had our own science and our science was witchcraft, you see. But that was our science. We <laughs> wanted to jump on a broom and fly, you know. So that is the science that we need to interrogate and see how does this thing work, you see, you understand. So I, I don't know, how, how do you, I, I want you to, to, to speak to this. How do you put together, how do you speak to Pan-Africanism with respect to post-Africanism? How are the two related? No, no, the, the, the issue is, you see, the Pan-Africanist dream is, is, is self-contradictory. Mm -hmm. The self-contradiction is the very leaders that we admire as great Pan-Africanists were actually, they were only Pan-Africanists in Accra or in Addis Ababa. Mm. When they got back home, they weren't Pan-Africanist. So, so let me take Kenneth Kaunda, right? Mm -hmm. so, so Kenneth Kaunda, great leader, great Pan-Africanist, and they were looking in, when they were talking of Pan-Africanism, it's one united Africa. Kwame Nkrumah was very straightforward about it. One united Africa. And yet, when they get back to Lusaka, things change. In other words, the dream of a one united Africa did not go beyond the speeches they were giving in Addis Ababa or in Accra. That's why when they make laws in Zambia, what were the laws saying? You could only be a Zambian citizen. You could not be a Malawan, Zambian. You could not be Congolese, Zambian. You could not be Angolan, Zambian. You could not be Rhodesian, Zambian. You couldn't. <clears throat> and so when you are born in Zambia, your worldview, your worldview is that of nationalist, selfish nationalism, looking to your own country. You are not looking to your neighbor. And so, and so, and so that is the, the issue with the, the, the political, because, because education matters, attitudes matter. And when you begin planting those attitudes, it means you are, you are then sowing seeds that are going to limit you. And so we need to begin thinking differently. And how do we begin thinking differently? By us Africans begin saying the idea that the law limited Zambian citizenship to become purist definition of Zambian citizenship was incompatible with African realities. It is not enough to shout that we are one and a united continent. That is useless. That's a slogan. Mm. What does it mean practically? And so that is where the issue was. So post-Africanism is thinking differently. It is going beyond all these slogans and saying, what are the practical ways? How do we how do we do it? How do we begin with 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 regional integration as we are pushing for that huge grand dream? Because it's very easy to have a huge big dream out there. Mm. It's very easy to say, love one another, love everybody. But when you actually bring it back to you and say loving another is actually <laughs> talking about loving a Katangis, a Congolese, a Kasai. It's about the, 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 the Bakongo in Angola and the Bakongo in, in, in Congo actually being one people and, and perceiving them as one people. That is where the biggest work needs to be. Okay, you know? so, uh, yeah, 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 I agree with you. So the, the, the main issue here is that I think we, we still have a long way to go, you know, to realize this dream of, and Africanism, because the, 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 the Western world, or should I say, really did a lot of damage to making sure that there's divide and rule. They made sure that we were divided, you know, uh, along borderlines, along 
tribal lines around right. extractions. So they made sure that those aspects they bring them too much so that you know. All right, if they but, but, but Ryan, Ryan mm -hmm. so so that is a very pan Africanist view, and I agree with you. Mm. But we need to move beyond it because the people who are making Zambian law is no longer the British. It is Kenneth Kaunda and his parliament who sat down in spite of contradictory experience, mm -hmm. in spite of Kaunda himself being a Malawan. He sits down in Lusaka and he makes a law that you can only be a Zambian citizen, purist Zambian, uh, Zambian conception of, of citizenship. Are we going to blame that on the British? You know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. Zambia has made a lot of uh, progress, particularly in Constitution 2016, where they say a person can hold dual nationalities. It has come 50 years late. Right? 50 years late. It's very important. But mm -hmm. even now, it's mm -hmm. more than just the law. We need to begin changing people's um, worldviews. Exactly. Now, let me ask you a question. Um, you see, you are saying when they came to Lusaka, you know, the passing laws and stuff like that, but as a lawyer yourself, as a counsel, I would like to find out, like, how much of the British constitution did we retain, you know, since we've been amending this constitution? And I, I, I mean, most of it, the skeleton was that of what was left to us by the, by the British. Right. How much of that did we change, you know? to come in line with, to own it ourselves? How much was that to change? Look, I don't care how much time it takes for us to own something, mm. but what we need to look at is that at, what, at some point we own it. And 50 years is way too long. 100 years is way too long. It's, it's, it's way too long for us to continue blaming the British for the constitution. We need to begin thinking differently, make changes, take destiny in our hands and say, the British were wrong, they gave us a wrong constitution, but we are going to cure it. Yeah. No, that's where that's why it's, a, it's a very pan-Africanist to blame somebody else, <laughs> to blame the French, to blame colonialism. Now, I'm not saying that the institutions of colonialism are irrelevant they are relevant. What I am saying is that we can still apportion blame to the British while taking responsibility for what we can change now. Yes. Now you see, here's the, here's the, here's the issue. Yes, we need to take responsibility to what we can change now. That is, that is granted, that is accepted. However, the issue comes to comes back to what you've said to say, our leaders are selfish. For example, there is this archaic law which the British were using, you know, to, to trample upon the freedoms, you know, right. of assembly and stuff like that. Right. The Public Order Act. Right. So it has been a song to every politician to say, this is the law the British were using to come down on our freedom. Who we'll change right. it? They come into power because they know if everyone is free, it will somehow disadvantage them. They want to cling on to it. So in as much as we are saying we have the responsibility as Africans, as Zambians ourselves, to make sure that we do things that work for us. But there are those things that, you know, our colonial masters left to us that we are still benefiting. Right. So we cannot let go to an extent that it becomes equal to everyone to enjoy. Now that becomes a problem. That's where the problem is. I don't know your reflection on that one. Right. Um, I, I definitely agree. And this is the time for us to begin thinking differently. That's why our orientation with post-Africanism is to say, let us begin thinking differently. Because there is a symbiotic relationship. You know, these things are depending on each other. Uh, colonialism and post-colonialism, they are actually feeding off each other. The post-independence African leaders, they did not create a, a distance 
from colonialism. They became the new colonial masters. Of course, they were black. Exactly. Mm. They spoke our language, but they adopted the whole system of colonialism. And so how do we begin reimagining the African myth? It's to say, we don't want to agree with you just because you fought independence for us. No, we want to agree with you as our hero if you begin solving the problems we have now. That is the most important thing. The, the one of the arguments that post-African leaders gave for repression, most of them was, they said, we need to recreate the African village. And how we recreate the African village is to use the very colonial laws that the colonialists left. Mm -hmm. Look at what Kenneth Kaunda said, look at Mobutuism, look at all these um, um, uh, post-independence leaders. They were using the same thing and saying that those are the, are the, are the, are the principles that are going to inform their future. We continue repression. Uh, we continue with, 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 with their misunderstanding of what it meant to be an African village. So what do we do now? Let's begin thinking differently. And thinking differently means sometimes coming head to head with a pan-Africanist philosophy that was actually colonial. Because nobody thinks about this. The fact that pan-Africanism itself mm. could be could be based on, on, on colonialism. Let me bring Wiseman. Wiseman, what are you following our discussion today? Yes, uh, I'm following the, our discussion. This is a very difficult discussion because it's not very sexy. You know what I mean when I say sexy, right? Exactly. I'm uh, no. <laughs> Wiseman, what do you think about post-Africanism and pan-Africanism and everything we are dealing with today? Africa Freedom Day. Okay, uh, I think uh, as uh, as uh, as as we as, as we celebrated this day, I think it's very important that you bring this topic uh, forward. Uh, uh, in, for me, I think uh, and uh, to what I understand is that uh, uh, we have got a lot to do, uh, comrades, uh, to bring uh, to bring Africa together and uh, to have uh, the uh, United of Africa. I think uh, we have got a lot of things to do. First of all. As we, have, as we have said, we need uh, to start uh, thinking different in the sense that, uh, uh, mm -hmm. first of all, we have to bring our mind together, like uh, on right. an individual basis. First right. of all, we have to clean our house. When you clean your own, your own house, you, you, you start looking at on the other big picture, like, okay, if I'm able to clean my own house, like here where I'm staying here in Kawe, I, I shouldn't see anyone as my neighbor. I should see anyone as my relative. Then from right. there, I shift now to say, okay, Kawe and Lusaka, we are not neighbors, we are one family. Then from there, I'm able to extend from Lusaka, Livingston, or now right. Zambia at large. Right. The problem which I've seen is that uh, uh, even here in Zambia, as we are trying to look at uh, Africa as a, as a, at, at, a, at a large extent, even here in right. Zambia, we have, we, have, we have divided Zambia into neighbors, where now we have, we have, we have put these so-called chiefs and these so-called chiefs, as important as they are, they, they try by all means to demarcate this area and say, this is where my land belongs and uh, this is my people. From there, we are dividing instead of uniting. So I think uh, we have got a lot, a lot of things to do for us to bring Africa together. We have to start right. with our own, very own. Right. So, so thank you. Thank you, Wiseman. Now, I just want to address some of the comments that we are receiving. Patricia Chimba is saying, it has to unite to be strong and develop because that's the only way we can have one currency. Africa would be a giant if it unites. Please don't preach division. Um, the, the, the question of, of, of African unity is not in dispute. The only question is how. And in order for us to get to the how, we need shock treatment in Africa. And the shock treatment we need is for Africans to interrogate why, first of all, they want to be united as one country. How can we be pushing for a one united Africa when our regions themselves are not integrated? 
our peoples themselves are taught every day to be divided. How can they unite? So we want to create a shock treatment at this high level in order for us to bring, to build a unity from the bottom up, a principle-centered unity, not the colonially inspired unity. Because contrary to the assertions that the, the Europeans divided Africa, in actual fact, the dream of Cecil Rhodes was not to divide Africa. Cecil Rhodes' dream was actually to unite Africa. That is what it means. He said that he wanted an, one Africa from Cape to Cairo so that once they united, they will find it easy to exploit it. And every other successive Pan-Africanist project has been following on Cecil Rhodes' dream. What we need to think as post-Africans is to give shock treatment to that dream and say, can we begin with blocks, simple blocks? That's it. Mm. Can we begin loving each other? Can we begin looking at the importance of the individual? Because as we build those bricks together, we, if we agree, then we are going to form that, 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 that united, united thing. But this idea that somehow we must just continue aspiring for something without building it is what has led us in the sense where in the in the state where we are currently because because africans idolize as despots in their own countries this is a contradiction how does Haile Selassie become one of the most celebrated leaders of africa and yet one of the most despised leaders in ethiopia hmm. How can Robert Mugabe be the celebrated leader of Africa and yet be reviled in Zimbabwe? It's not enough to say that, no, the prophet is not liked in his own country. There is a, there is a pattern here. Unless we know how to build in smaller blocks, this idea that somehow uh, uh, focusing our energy on this big grand dream is the solution might not actually be uh, be, 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 be helpful at all. And so, and so that is where my advocacy comes from. It is to interrogate this very idea of, of African unity being promoted everywhere. It's like when you stand up and say Africa must be one, everybody says yes, it must be one without asking the questions. Are you respecting the African? Are you respecting your neighbor? Is is, is Mobutu respecting his neighbors? Or he's a celebrated African because he was, he could, he could ins insult the whites? What about Mugabe? What about uh, Haile Selassie? What about several other celebrated Africans? What about if we began thinking differently about the African project? Um, there was one more contribution here. Um, it's, it, it's unsustainable. We don't need political unity. We need economic partnerships. Yeah, and, and the easy thing is there are several um, efforts that have been led by the AU. I think that is the right direction to go. Uh, try to have some economic unities, um, the unity of principle, very important, unity of principle. Um, just to give an example, the relationship between Zimbabwe and South Africa. While Mugabe is, is invading white-owned farms, the people of Zimbabwe, the blacks of Zimbabwe, are leaving Zimbabwe to go into South Africa, where much of the land in South Africa is still owned by whites. When Tabo Mbeki is asked to challenge the policy of Mugabe in Zimbabwe, Tabo Mbeki says no, because Mugabe is an African hero. He refuses to intervene, leading to a series of events that leads to the, depo to, to, to the, to the, to the overthrow of Robert Mugabe in Zimbabwe. 
We cannot have unity if we cannot hold each other accountable. And accountability starts with the home, not with the aspiration or slogans that a person throws around. Everybody can insult the whites. Everybody can insult those who enslaved us. But can everybody work for the betterment of their own communities and of their own countries? That is where we are going to judge who the, uh, the great Africans are, who the great African heroes are. Herbert Bilika. Uh, Herbert, I think Herbert is, uh, is, is not there. How can Africa develop when learned people like you, Elias Musha, are in Canada? <laughs> okay. This is a very important question. How can Africa develop when Africans are not in Africa? That question is very, very interesting. Our Germans developed German and yet some Germans were not in German. Russia, Japan, China, China itself. Right now, the, 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 the Chinese, Canadian, are a very significant part of this country here in Canada. They're a significant part of the population in America. In other words, we need to be delivered from this idea that in order for Africa to develop, all Africans must live in Africa. No. Because what, what, what that does is it, it, it disempowers our progress. It disempowers us into thinking that you've got to be... But Africa is bigger than just the continent itself. If you took the census right now, there are more blacks in America than live in Zambia. In other words, America is a bigger black nation than Zambia is. How many blacks does America have? About 30 million blacks? How many blacks does Brazil have? About 60, is it 60 or 50 million blacks? And so is America a black country? Of course it is. Is it an African country? It should be. It has 30 million African descended people in, in, in America. And so we cannot give the excuse. What we need is to cooperate and work together. Africans in the diaspora right now, when they go back to their own countries, they can't contribute meaningfully. And that's where the conversation needs to begin from. They can't. Engineers, doctors, Maybe only doctors, because there is something about medicine that makes it more acceptable. But engineers, they can't. Doctors, professionals, lawyers, it's even worse for lawyers. China developed because it identified its diaspora in the West. They went back to China and replicated the very things that they were learning in the West. That's what, that's what happened. Industries, artisanship, trades, science technology. Isn't it what happened? That is why China is where it is today. But today, everybody talks about the African diaspora as if the African diaspora is an enemy. Without realizing that for African nations to develop, it must leverage the power of its diaspora. That is what it the diaspora are not, are, not, are not sellouts. Of course, if you have 100 diasporans, you might have maybe 50 sellouts, but there is a good number of people there that can help the country develop. But how does it respond? Sometimes African countries are not responding properly to the diaspora, and this thinking is one of them. <laughs> so, so when I am contributing to, the, to, to Zambia, it's not enough. We are coming live. We are advocating for the rule of law. We are sending a little bit of change back home. It is making a huge difference. We are uh, helping, and that is not enough. Africa cannot develop if every African settled in, in Africa. What about Israel? What about Jews? What about Arabs? What about the Lebanese? What about all these people? We need to be everywhere. But our focus should be on development rather than just on finger pointing where somebody is. 
the vision of Kwame Nkrumah and first leaders had was for the future. Uh, quite all right, but this is a time where we begin interrogating, you know? And, and one of the things that I notice, I don't know whether it's just about, we, we rarely hold ourselves accountable in Africa. So when you begin critiquing the leadership of the first century, of the first century, of post-independence Africa, some people think that you are just trying to be difficult. In other words, we cannot assess the strengths and the weaknesses of the time that followed after colonialism. And that is that is that is a big a big issue. Um, Chipego, would you like to come on? Wave if you want to come on, Chipego Chifue. Yes, Chipego. What uh, do you good have afternoon, to say? Mr. Monsha. Good afternoon. Uh, I've got a question. Yes, I've got a question and the contribution here. Yes, please. I can yes, um I agree with wise man when he said the first step we should take as africans is clean our household yes because what i've noticed with africans is that we've got a problem with respecting each other the first thing we should do is we respect each other because yeah. africans i don't know if it's because of our colonial masters we think our colonial masters are, are above us huh? so we don't right. respect each other so there are, some, there are some instances where one can own a company, then if they go and they go to a bank and apply for a loan, the bank would reject. But if the company the black man owns has a white man as manager right. and the same white man goes, goes to the bank, the bank will give right. them the loan. So I think for us, like, so the first step is respecting each other. Yes, if you want to move on. Right step right. in rethinking the African dream is respect. Yeah, then uh, you said something about the national national nationalism. It's about being selfish and all that. Yes, I, I wanted to ask about uh, Patrice Lumumba, just right. just uh, from the Congo. What do you think of his plan and idea was of Africa? Yeah, then. Right. My other contribution is on education. So um, I'm a student in, here in Zambia. So what I've noticed is that when we're learning at school, uh, what we are taught is, as Africans, we are, we are taught to become employees and we're not taught on how we can build businesses and all that to contribute to our economy. So right. I think Africa, as 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 Africa, yes, Africa, Zambia, we need to change portions of our education system so that people are not only taught to become employees and how to work in, uh, yeah, how to work for people, but also be taught on how to start up businesses and contribute to the economy of the countries. Then the last point is that uh, Af I think policies should be changed. Yeah, you talked about us as Africans getting foreign aid, yeah, aid from the others and how it can also benefit us as Africans. Yes, I don't agree with, I, I agree with you when you say Africans shouldn't insult the people that are outside just because they hate Africa. Yes, that is not African, but how, the, I've got two questions. Yes, I asked you about Lumumba and the national nationalism plan had for Africa. Now I want to ask another question about how us as Africa can get foreign aid without giving out a high, a huge percentage of our African resources. I think that's all. Right. Okay, so, so Lumumba. Lumumba was a great hero. The, 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 the thing with history is that when you are critiquing a person, you were not part of the experience that they lived in. But, but Africans must grow a body of critical, um, uh, critical analysis and criticism of their own history. It's very important. So when you look at Lumumba, Lumumba was a great leader. But because we are not living in his time, we can only look back, praise what he did, and critique what he did not do well. 
could it have been different, for example, that if he if his speech at independence in 1960 were a little different, would it have helped? Um, would it have been better if he he handled the America uh, Russian ambiguity differently? Would it have helped? Those are things that we, we, we will never know for sure, right? But Lumumba remains, um, uh, and, and his, his real name was Elias. Uh, Elias remains one of the great leaders of, 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 of our continent, and we can never take away from that. Our duty at the moment is only to reflect back and say, maybe if he had said something different in that speech, if he had sounded a little reconciliatory, if we had taken a little bit of Mugabe in 1980, remember? Both Mugabe and Lumumba faced with very similar situations. Mugabe's speech was much more reconciliatory and, and, and so Zimbabwe does better for the next few years and then he destroys it because he wants to continue in power and everything else in 1980 when, when, when he assumes and then in the 2000s when he loses popularity. Could the same have happened with Lumumba? If Lumumba had said, yes, we are an independent country, but we are not going to have this fiery approach, could it have helped? Could Congo's uh, fortunes been a little different? Those are things that we are going to continue interrogating. Could it have stopped the rise of, of, of General Mobutu? You know, because Mobutu takes advantage of, 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 of the Lumumba issue. He takes advantage of it and he shows himself to be, first of all, somebody who can unite the Congo. Secondly, he shows himself to be much more amiable to Western interests. Um, if Lumumba was a little bit reconciliatory, could that have been avoided? We, 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 we really do not have answers to that. But Lumumba remains one of the great leaders. In terms of education, um, um, there is a lot that we can do about changing the curriculum and everything else. But I think what is much more fundamental is that we begin thinking differently. We begin thinking differently about Africa. I think that is the most important thing, no matter what the education is. Right now in Zambia, the, 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 we have shifted in Zambia, right? We have shifted from trends to academics in Zambia right now. We have shifted from no investment in science, zero investment in science, to, to arts. Now, there is nothing wrong with the arts. The arts are good, quite all right. But if we are going to build an economy for tomorrow, then we must begin investing in technology, in trades, and in science. The least funded schools are trade schools in Zambia right now. And, and, and then we have somebody stands up and says that we are going to, uh, to protect our copper. How can we protect our copper if we do not have artisans, not just artisanal miners, small scale miners, artisans in Zambia who would be able to work those places to refine our copper? We have, we have made no investment. So the kind of deficit we have in trades in Zambia is huge. China is where it is today because of its investment in trades and, 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 and um, artisanal investment, artisanal education. That is, that is what is going to make a difference. Is there anyone with a plan in Zambia right now among politicians? Very few plans as far as trades and artisanal education is concerned. Nothing. Right? So those, those will be my my contributions. We've already run over one hour. I never expected that our talk today would in fact last that long. Okay. Yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, great points worth reflecting on. Um, why do I always praise Cecil Rhodes? I do not praise Oliver Kapamba. This is the thing because Tamun Fua. I'm not praising now. The goal of this is, is of this lecture and interaction is to make it as pan-Africanist as possible, so that we can listen to it across the continent. And so I must avoid them. But I'm not saying that Cecil Rhodes. I'm not praising that Cecil Rhodes was uh, was a 
I was a Pan-Africanist. In fact, I'm condemning Pan-Africanism to the extent that Pan-Africanism actually comes from a, a colonial dream of Cecil Rhodes, who dreamt of a one united Africa, which most Pan-Africanists adopted and critically. And after they adopt it, they continue pushing it. That is where the issue is. So, so, so it's a new way of thinking when you actually tell a Pan-Africanist to say, your vision of African unity is actually coming from Cecil Rhodes. They then begin thinking, so this is actually a colonial dream. If it's a colonial dream, how can we begin thinking differently in order for us to achieve an African dream? What is that African dream going to be? Respect for the African individual, respect for regional integration, um, laws that are much more um, uh, alive to African realities. I think that is where the thing is. Otherwise, these slogans of a one united Africa without building the bricks is completely useless. Anyway, I think we are going to end here. Thank you, thank you, wise man, and, and thank you for all the contributions and all the questions. We couldn't get to all the um, all the all the questions. Somebody is saying that it is Kwame's uh, Kwame's dream, of course. <laughs> the first Pan Africanist is not Kwame Nkrumah; it's actually Cecil Rhodes. The dream of a united Africa from Cape to Cairo is Cecil Rhodes, and so to the extent that Kwame Nkrumah adopted. The colonialist dream, it is, it is colonial. So we begin asking, how can we begin thinking differently about this? How do we respect individuals and respect uh, regional integration? God bless you and, uh, and God bless our country. Thank you for joining us today. And as usual, if you want to send stars to TV Bakwetu, please do so. We welcome that. God bless you and God bless our continent. Thank you.